thank you so much ma'am thank you palra sir thank you shaila for uh, giving this opportunity do at the outset uh, i would say uh, in the beginning this was meant to be my role was a chairperson and i have been uh, it was been updated the way i think the pcos is getting updated i think my role also has been updated so just in last 3 days i have uh, had chance to prepare this talk and that's why i've kept it very specific to pcos only uh, and we'll talk about some pearls i think we know that the pcos one of the diagnostic sign by radiologists is the spring of pearl sign so we'll talk about some particular points related to imaging of pcos so the polycystic ovary syndrome uh, is a heterogeneous multifactorial and polygenic condition originally described by stan leventhal as a stan leventhal syndrome they described it as a large glistening sclerocystic ovaries and uh, we know the the key features are menstrual cycle disturbance hyper and androgenism and obesity where ovarian dysfunction is central 8 to 13% of women of reproductive age tend to have this but this figure can go up to 20% depending on what diagnostic criteria we use because the diagnostic criteria are changing over a period of time as the machines are becoming better as the other hormonal assays are giving you better insight into the disease and more ivf treatments are being uh you know uh, facilitated so the this kind of you know increase or uh, you know it's uh, 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 a percentage of uh, would go up over a period of time now to radiologist i think general it is understood that we get referral from either endocrinologist or gynecologist and this one small paper generally uh, is a comparative study which shows about polycystic ovarian syndrome the marked differences between endocrinologist and gynecologist in diagnosis and management as far as radiologists are concerned we would help both i mean there is not much we really see different but for endocrinologists the emphasis is on obesity management and metabolic syndrome with hirsutism and metformin is their mainstay in the treatment while a gynecologist would always be worried and concerned about the fertility part and the fertility treatment related to pcos or by you know by doing induction they may treat the patient and they may overlook other issues about the metabolic syndrome but that's why the clomiphene is their mainstay so this is the one basic thinking about me as a radiologist that how i can you know uh, kind of keep it in my mind that the referral can be different but what's normal the volume and the size of ovary really varies from time to time and we have a good list and you know range across the age in a pre and post menopausal woman as well as something a ball a part figure of higher volume more than 18 cc is considered as abnormal so these are the general guidelines available in the books of radiology but we should note one important point is very uh, specifically whenever there is a ellipsoid structure like ovary we tend to take three measurements in two axis one in two axis so a single axis of the axial plane and the other in the opposite to that axis 90 degree rotation done and then taken the third measurement so that length height and width is always divided Uh, multiplied by half and that gives us the volume and whenever we talk of ovarian volume in this talk it would be depending on this ellipsoid formula that's why i think i uh, would highlight this point we know there is lot of variation in the size and the appearances of the ovaries and we understand even all barbies are not the same so i think ethnicity and the patient's genetic makeup everything will have some impact on that and that's why the figures would vary a lot the reason why the figure may vary a lot is also that ov ovary being a dynamic structure which responds to lot of hormonal in inputs would naturally behave in a such a different fashion that it may have a corpus luteum or albicans or other retainer cyst and retention cyst and that could cause volume changes but 
this is generally a, a normal looking ovary which shows us some peripherally located follicles of varying size and one of them could be a dominant follicle they are generally randomly organized they may be looking in the periphery but they could be some what in the center also unlike in a polycystic ovary where the pattern would be mainly towards the periphery when it is a peripheral pattern rather than a generalized cystic pattern so i think this is our normal appearance so whenever we see a nice big dominant follicle which in three dimension measures 10 mm cube then we would think that that is a normal pattern that particular ovary what is abnormal i think and this is where the evolving pcu criteria are going to radiologists to learn new things over a period of time we know it started way back in 1990 with national institute of health talking about only those two important uh, endocrine factors and the clinical factor that is the and androgen excess and menstrual dysfunction but rotterdam with, that is the ishri and asrm in 2003 they came out with those two criteria as in addition to that they added a polycystic ovary documentation and thereby a radiologist or sonologist role came into picture over a period of time that has been again revised and that's why the number of follicles per ovary that criteria is going to change over a period of time but as of now what we do we'll discuss about that in the androgen axis and pcos society which was a little later on they included hyperandrogenism clinical or biochemical ovarian dysfunction which could be uh, suggested by oligo or an ovulation or polycystic ovary so i think what we understand is two criteria out of three should be fulfilled by this uh, evolving criteria and there is a good ultrasound and histopath correlation is found that means whenever you do ultrasound of that particular ovary of polycystic ovary pattern and there was a histopath correlation of that particular ovary it has shown that the ultrasound would help to come to the conclusion that this particular ovary can be labeled as a polycystic okay i think uh, so we understand that we should exclude all other disorders which can be confusing with the pcos and two out of three criteria are important for us to move ahead now this marla lujan she has had very nice landmark paper they stated that updated ultrasound criteria for polycystic ovary syndrome and they changed the real thresholds and elevated the follicular population number and the ovarian volume in their opinion the rotterdam consensus was for having 12 or more follicles between 2 to 9 mm that is follicle number per ovary or an ovarian volume more than 10 cm cube that is 10 cm so 10 cc we would call it but this was changed to incorporate more increase the number of follicles to make it more specific because this they realize is causing lot of other conditions which are not truly pcos are getting labeled as pcos because of the little relaxed threshold so what is that then over a period of time the update has come and it talks about consensus glide guideline given in 2018 it shows that when you use a high frequency endovaginal probe in patients of 8 years post menarche that is 8 years just uh, gynecal age, age after the menarche follicle number per ovary of 20 and or ovarian volume of more than 10 ml ensuring there is no corpora lutea cyst or dominant follicle are present then you would label it as a pcos on that uh, ultrasound criteria but for some reason if you are not using endovaginal which is considered as actually the gold standard but if you can't use it because patient is not sexually uh, active or some for other reason then we would not rely so much on internal morphology but we'll rely on the ovarian volume itself because that is something which we can measure provided the patient's bladder uh, is not over distended so much so that ovary gets squashed inside and then the threshold of more than 10 ml of on either side of ovary not necessarily one because it has been found that during a full bladder ultrasound one of the ovary may escape little beyond or it may go into the caldesac or it may get compressed 
so even if one ovary shows that typical pattern and volume higher than 10 ml then we would again label it as pcos the diagnostic criteria are adju are existent in adolescent female who are less than 20 year age in whom ultrasound should not be used that's the guideline but it has been shown that over a period of time even they would show some pattern by which you can suggest a pco pattern but this has been uh, you know done for one specific reason is because at that age there is a high incidence of multi follicular ovaries that's why we don't want a wrong diagnosis that's why they would not rely too much on to ultrasound they would rather rely on a biochemical markers and a clinical presentation of the out of those three the other two parameters would be given more importance so now this guideline will supersede the rotterdam criteria of 12 follicles which we discussed earlier and the interim recommendation was of 24 and it has been brought down to 20 that is the current criteria the presence of single multi follicular ovary is sufficient to provide the sonographic criterion of pcos because again we will see in one paper that not necessarily both ovaries would be showing those pattern and that's the reason why uh, some other morphological features also are taken into consideration these are the features which are described but they do not contribute the formal diagnostic criteria is the hyperechoic ventral stroma which is a very peculiar sign on ultrasound and when you see it you would realize that it is a really catches your eye peripheral location of follicle we talk about string of pearl sign follicles of similar size measuring 2 to 9 that is the secondary antral uh, follicles and the single largest dimension of more than 3.5 cm has been prescribed as a some other formal diagnostic uh, non formal diagnostic criteria what are the ultrasound markers to predict a polycystic ovary syndrome is follicle number per ovary which is called as fnpo ovarian volume which we discussed those three measurements multiplied by 0.5 or divided by 2 whatever you want to call it follicle number per single cross section because this is applicable when you are doing mainly the 2d ultrasound follicle distribution pattern we this will discuss this stromal area that means the stromal to ovarian area that means how much is the stroma and how much is the ovary that ratio and stromal index so these are the criteria stromal index is not really popular but stromal to ovarian ratio follicle number per ovary ovarian volume and the pattern is considered as one of the uh, kind of very useful size in day to day practice now number of follicle has been always kind of a fascinating thing for radiologists because this number would vary over a period of time but this paper in 2003 had really pointed one simple question is ultrasound examination of polycystic ovaries is it worth counting the follicle and in about 10 years time now there is another paper which says follicle number not the assessment of ovarian stroma represents the best ultrasonic marker for polycystic ovarian syndrome so the number of follicle would remain here and it would be counted by radiologists religiously if they are tired of counting maybe the software would do that for them and that is why we have realized the fnpo if it is 26 patient is definitely going to have pco but on the flip side we know that as the age advances the fnpo would reduced does that mean is it the cure no it is not because we know that pcos is a non genetic disorder it cannot be cured it would sort of show reduced kind of clinical features but the it being genetic it would remain there but this is how the number of the follicles per ovary which are considered as a diagnostic has changed over a period of time and one of the reason why it has happened is the machines have improved tremendously over a period of time which shows much smaller follicle now coming to the actual ultrasound route and timing we generally want to do tvs unless it is not allowed or not possible then you may do trans abdominal very rarely trans rectal route has been used for in a very obese unmarried patient sometimes uh, when they are uh, you know agreeing to do that in presence of a chaperon we have done this and that has also given us good volume about the uterus the endometrium and the ovary 3d and cine loops they also are very important for radiologists to 
accumulate them because there can be a lot of post processing to measure the total number of follicles and by applying a software you can actually count those follicles and highlight them so this is the reason why you want to highlight that as one of the technical point automated follicle counting software mainly used in ivf to show whether that particular ovary is hyper hypo or uh, normo responsive to given hormones what is the relevant history i think obviously age because we want to not do this in less than 20 last menstrual period oligo or amenorrhea the menstrual history pattern which would be clinicians will be always and gynecologists helping us about and telling us what we are their clinical uh, impression is and we would probably do a patient who is regularly menstruating will be scanned between days 3 to day 5 of their menstrual cycle if they are non menstruating if between after the induction of menses in those three days also you can do as a alternative medications we would know whether patient is on oral and uh, contraceptive gnrh agonist and fertility medication that is very very important now this is our old classical picture way back in 1995 97 that how uh, ovary still looks the same i think it is a diagnostic thing when you take on tv as a look which has multiple follicles a lot of stroma here and peripherally located follicle all around this was a very simple diagnostic clue one of the measurement here is already 51 mm so that has crossed 3.5 by miles and 2.3 is the other measurement and you would take the third measurement and showing that in addition to that the endometrial you know uh, uh, appearance and increase ovarian stroma and increase volume and the pattern of the typical uh, uh, you know uh, seen on tvs of the string of pearls we would call this without any hesitation the polycystic ovary pattern that is the pco pattern now this is the general video picture uh, just for our uh, clinicians you know uh, to know that how uh, ovary can be traced in all three directions to know how are the follicles placed how much is the stroma in the center if there is any dominant follicle there and you would do this live and record this if required for your uh, retrospective viewing so this is uh, one important tool in diagnosis or from those old type of images now the machines have improved and the stroma is much better seen the follicles are very nicely identified and you can actually count and label them either per slice or in the entire ovary depending on the volume you take and the volume here easily is crossing 12 here and it is crossing 16 here on the right in our practice we have always seen that the volume would always be little unequal and we don't know the reason generally it is always more on the right compared to the left and this is one of the observation and that is the reason why people have said that you would probably diagnose pco not just looking at uh both ovaries sometimes you would get the clue only in the one ovary and that is should be kept in mind now endometrial thickness is another thing which has to be documented because without that our phase of uh, that particular you know uh, cycle would not be correctly assessed and whether the patient is responsive or hyperandrogenic would be also depending on that you would get the uh, state of your uh, you know endometrium including the vascularity newer generation unit will support higher number of follicles per ovary because we tend to see them much better due to better resolution because 2 mm is the cut off for seeing the secondary antral follicle where we really can see on most of the ultrasound machines nowadays and the threshold now finally has been come to 12 follicles numbers per ovary of 2 to 9 mm size the best compromise for a good sensitivity of 99% and a good specificity of to 75%. So these variabilities should be kept in mind but there would be always uh, you know something which is good for sensitivity and something which is good for specificity. That's our same pattern you can see even on trans abdominal ultrasound you can see multiple peripheral located uh, 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 you know for small you know, follicles of 2 to 9 mm all equally looking follicles in the periphery this is symmetrical enlarged pattern on trans abdominal uh, sonography pco that is a polycystic ovarian pattern would be of two type one is called as polycystic ovary which is of the peripheral type and generalized uh, cystic pattern which is called as gcp 
these are the two different morphologies which reflect different histological types and both reflect specific endocrine PCOS pattern. But generally, we'll see one of two criteria are important for each pattern. Now, women with PCOS can be ovulatory. In that situation, you tend to see sometimes a dominant follicle or irregular uh, corpus luteum. In such a situation, if you really feel this looks like PCO, the prudent thing is that you would call them in the next cycle and recheck them for presence of PCOS because such a kind of, uh, you know, presence of such a uh, structure there would not um, uh, allow you to measure the volume correctly and the uh, size of the follicle also would be not between 2 to 9, it would be going above 10 millimeters. So that is the one of the reason we should keep in mind. So now do hypo, hyperandrogenic women with normal menses have polycystic ovary syndrome? Yes, I think it has been suggested that out of 74% hyperandrogenic women who report normal menses may have evidence of polycystic ovary syndrome. And that's why this has happened because when the less stringent criteria are applied, they will allow inclusion of more normal androgenic women at, but it will also allow more andro, uh, normal androgenic women who are at risk for PCOS and its future complication. Hence, revision is always proposed and is always going to be on and on and on. And that is why we tend to see the criteria changing over a number of uh, a few couple of years. Now, this is about the, I think this has been discussed already by our previous speaker in at length and they have also said that whether you would replace uh, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, marker about the number of, uh, you know, uh, as a patient having polycystic ovary syndrome, they hypothesize that the excessive follicle number assessed by ovarian ultrasonography would correlate well with serum anti-mullerian hormone concentration and that's why that can be used as a surrogate for classical marking of hyperandrogenism and maybe that could be sometimes used in, instead of ultrasound that you can use this AMH as your one of the markers uh, and that is a possible discussion what we have had in uh, prior lecture. So now coming to one more additional factor is the color Doppler, which we add into that to know whether the stroma within shows a lot of vascularity, uh, which has what resistive index and this can be measured. And why do we measure that? Because the Doppler criteria says that the stromal blood flow, intraoven stromal blood flow is significantly higher in polycystic ovaries than the normal ovaries or even the GCP pattern compared to PC, uh, PCP pattern. The PCP pattern will have more stromal flow compared to the GCP pattern, both the resistive index, that is the RI value, which is commonly and easily measured, is significantly lower in the PCOS compared to normal patients. And they also have raised peak systolic velocities. RI is inversely proportional to LH FSH ratio and normal ovaries will have RI between 0.6 to 0.7, while in PCS it will be lesser than 0.6 definitely and that is the uh, you know criteria which is applied as a additional non-formal marker flow patterns correlate with future response to ivf what whatever we see the flow whether those particular patients are going to respond well to your ivf uh, you know stimulation is also determined on that and uh, that is why we would take certain values here and take measurement within this by switching on the color you will see lot of vascularity is seen within which can be documented very easily taken a nice kind of spectrum there and documented uh, whether it is showing a high uh, ri values or low ri values and that can be uh, you know uh, put into the paper while we describe the final report now stromal echogenicity is one additional factor which is again an important factor which depends on the androgen level so raised androgens in early follicular phase will cause more recruitment of multiple follicles. They will be uh, responding to the hyperinsulinemia and other metabolic factors, and they do not allow these follicles to become dominant. So there is a maturation arrest and premature luteinization, and that causes atresia, and that leads to echogenic stroma, which is seen very easily, surrounded by that ream of follicles here. So what is the general ratio which we are considering? stromal area which is the central part 
and the mean ovarian ratio, which is the peripheral part, that ratio, if it is more than one third, that is 0.34, it has a very good specificity about the polycystic ovary uh, syndrome. The parameter may be used in routine clinical practice for improving ultrasound diagnosis of PCOS. If you can see this versus this, this is your PCP pattern and this is your GCP pattern, which could be going all along without having much of stroma in between. So that's the general distinction and why we would measure this stromal echogenicity because stromal hypertrophy directly correlates with rates, serum androstenedione levels. So that's why we would keep that into consideration. Multicystic ovary or polycystic ovarian morphology may be seen in women without the syndrome. And this is one example, very large ovaries, more than five centimeter, but we tend to see multiple scattered follicles all along without any stroma, without any endometrial thickness. Ovaries are quite bulky and they're sort of, uh, you know, dipping into the cul-de-sac on the either side of cervix. What it suggests, it suggests multicystic ovaries with normal ovarian stroma and normal endometrial thickness is a typical pattern. We would not call them at polycystic ovary and lack of stromal abundance differentiates PCO from MCO. And that is why we would label them specifically. And especially if this pattern is seen in uh, less than 20 years of age, then we would probably give a lot of importance to this point to talk about that uh, uh, and rely on the other hormonal factors rather than the ultrasound to diagnose polycystic ovary. Polycystic versus multifollicular pattern. There are generally in multifollicular pattern, the follicles tend to be larger than uh, two millimeter types. It is there is less stromal echodensity and normal ovarian volume may be seen and usually a dominant follicle is also seen. That's how we would differentiate. Now coming to this refined definition by uh, uh, ASRM and ES, uh, ASHRAE is woman having PCO in the absence of ovulation disorder or a hyperandrogenism that is the asymptomatic PCO should not be considered as having PCOS three-dimensional, that is the 3D ultrasound and Doppler ultrasound studies. As we saw in the prior uh, slides, it would be a useful research tools, but are not required in a definitive PCO diagnosis. I think coming to just quick, quick uh, points about 3D, how it is, uh, you know, one simple sweep will give you multiple volumes. One simple sweep will actually measure the follicles and you can design a uh, your parameters by saying five to eight would be in one category and the rest of would be in the other category by which you can designate which pattern is prevalent in your particular ultrasound pattern. Then you can individually trace them and derive a volume. But this is generally done for mainly for the IVF purpose to show the uh, and to explain patient graphically what exactly is happening to her ovaries. Post uh, PCO like appearance in elderly, especially when the CA125 is raised, when the suspected is neoplasm, even there was one such case where we thought this looks polycystic pattern. This was removed and this was a bilateral classical stromal hyperplasia, which could be sometimes precursor for other tumors. And this could be also part of the hyperthicosis. Insular resistances being central to the etiology of syndrome, it has also caused other consequences of PCOS, which radiologists are going to deal with, that is one is infertility, recurrent abortion, mainly the gynecological problem, dyslipidemias, hypertension, coronary atherosclerosis, mainly related to the cardiologist, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, mainly to deal with the endocrinologist, cerebrovascular accidents, and for oncologists, endometrial carcinoma. So there would be always some additional imaging required in certain cases. In general, for as PCOS, the additional imaging sometimes uh, MRI can be excellent tool to show the typical pattern. Same what replicates the ultrasound features, but in a simpler manner without uh, doing the transvaginal sonography. And that's why it is used in particular cases or certain metabolic syndrome. Even elastography, which can be done either under ultrasound or MRI can be done. In addition to that, if the patient has alcoholic or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and that can be monitored to monitor some of the additional uh, points seen in PCOS. Now, we discussed this also that 20% uh, of the patient showed only unilateral findings. So the unilateral finding doesn't rule out the PCOS. In fact, we should be on the lookout because only one ovary may show, other ovary may be not so easily seen. So you would be always looking at this point that you would not 
call uh, not give this diagnosis because it's seen only on one side what are the complication of pcos which we generally see as a radiologist is in young adolescent sometimes we see ovarian torsion and this paper says early polycystic ovary syndrome as a possible etiology of unexplained premenarchial ovarian torsion and this has been discussed uh, we see it quite often that's why we tend to see many torsion in a younger age group and at a particular around uh, you know 10 to 20 age group we tend to see them and we keep that point in mind whether that pattern is follicular uh, polycystic pattern and ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome with induction method is something which as a radiologist we tend to deal with as we uh, not just in diagnosis but also in a treatment part so we'll see one or two example of the torsion this is polycystic ovary known case and now she has normal ovary which is around 4.4 by 2.3 cm on a tender opposite side a large ovary which is about 6.5 by 3.6 cm and there is intra ovarian flow is reduced on the affected side with absence of venous flow then in the correct uh, you know diagnostic criteria with free fluid around as a marker we would call this a torsion in a against the background of polycystic ovary disease uh, infertility case treated with uh, hyperstimulation uh, can la land up with a large ovaries with lot of ascites and we tend to check the ovarian Uh, ri values and uh, guide the clinician sometimes put the pigtail to remove the flu fluid in a controlled manner and this is one of the pattern which we tend to see on a patients who have had prior uh, polycystic pattern on which to they have been stimulated so coming to last two slides the reporting we would talk about lmp the scan route separate report for each ovary number and size of follicles documentation of any follicle of more than 10 mm and its presence should be prompting us to do same uh, sonography next cycle ovarian volume calculate with simplified method which we discuss and endometrial thickness and morphology pcos summary of endocrinological correlation on this uh, dr panchal had discussed this and i thought this is a very interesting point for us to remember is whenever there is stromal abundance it talks about elevated insulin when there is more androgen we see more antral follicles and higher uterine artery resistance when there is more stromal vascularity that generally goes well with the more luteinizing hormone levels now last practical points due to lack of consensus sometimes it is easier to report the number of follicles in each ovary rather than attempt to label them as polycystic or multilocular ultrasound should not be used to diagnosis of pcos in the less than 8 year age we discussed that because of the multifollicular pattern being normally seen in them age cut off of 20 years is suggested for the utility of ultrasound in uh, in uh, in this diagnosis uh, and lastly but most importantly post menopausal women presenting with new onset severe or worsening hyperandrogenism including hirsutism require further investigation to rule out androgen secreting tumors and ovarian hyperthesis with this uh, i thank you all for your kind attention stay safe thank you so much for uh, this opportunity